you so much uh, to all. Sorry, I'm going to press record here. Yes, allow. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much to this, uh, the third Code of Ethics webinar being jointly hosted by the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance and the Walkley Foundation. I'm Karen Perth. I'm a Walkley director. I'm also the vice president of the media section of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance. I'm coming to you today from the land of the Jabwurrung and the Jadwajali people in Western Victoria. I pay my respects to the traditional owners of all of the lands upon which we meet and uh, we're viewing today. I uh, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We have a terrific lineup for you today uh, to discuss some of the thornier issues in the media today. Plagiarism, stealing stories, stealing ideas, stealing photographs, and the manipulation of images, which is a growing problem in the digital age. Our media panellists are Ginger Gorman. She's the editor of Broad Agenda, Australia's Ooh. leading research-based gender equality media platform. Welcome to Ginger. Thank She's you She's written much. a best-selling book, uh, Troll Hunting, a world leading work on cyber hate, and she's also been freelancing since 2015, and her work has been regularly plagiarised. She has a lot to say on this issue. <laughs> Bhakti Pubanentharam. Bhakti Pubanentharam is the editor of ABC Every Day, a digital lifestyle platform. Uh, Bhakti's also been the managing editor in the past of Crikey News, covering politics and the media, and she's held various editing roles at The Age here uh, in Melbourne. I'm not here in Melbourne, actually, usually I'm here in Melbourne, uh, across um, as well. And she's a, a judge with the Walkley's Award, so welcome to Bhakti as well. Um, James here. Ross is... Thanks, Karen. Oh, you, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great to see you. James Ross is a Melbourne-based staff photojournalist for the Associated Australian Associated Press and began working with the National Newswire in 2017, has since accepted a full-time position since the fabulous rebirth um, last year of the Newswire. And I've had the pleasure of working, working alongside James um, uh, at the courts mostly in recent years, and he's one of the great up-and-comers uh, in our industry. So I just want to, uh, I guess, give some warning because I'm in Garawood country here, that's around the, the Grampians, uh, as um, but the internet is perhaps not what it could be. So if I happen to fall off the, uh, the fabulous Ginger Gorman is going to pick up um, if we need to. And I know she'll handle things fabulously if that happened, happens. Now, um, these three amazing panellists are going to be joined by um, some expert presenters today. Kate Haddock, she's a Sydney-based copyright lawyer who will offer insight on what to do if your story has been uh, ripped off or someone has used your photographs. And in the second half of our webinar, we'll be looking um, we'll be hearing from John Bergen. He's from the Google News Initiative and he'll give tips on how to detect manipulated images. Um, that's because we're looking specifically at two sections of the Code of Ethics. That's section nine, presenting pictures uh, and sound that are true and accurate. Any manipulation that's likely to mislead should be disclosed, as well as section 10, do not plagiarise. Um, and you, the audience, will have a chance to ask some questions via the chat. So please put your questions in there, ask early, ask, ask often. Uh, the MEAA's Code of Ethics is one of the earliest journalist Code of Ethics, and it's uh, been guiding journalists, photographers, photojournalists, and, and all manner of media workers since the 1940s. So let's kick off initially. I'm going to start um, with a couple of quick questions before we go to Kate Haddock. So firstly, I want to hear back to you. How does the Code of Ethics guide your work? Uh, look, you know, in so many ways, at the ABC, where um, you worked for a long time, Karen, where I work now, the Code of Ethics is sits really side by side with the editorial policies. I think they mirror each other in a lot of ways, especially around fair dealing and, and treating people with respect. And, and all of this really falls under that broad moral category, I think, of respecting the work of other people. One way that I think plagiarism really comes up for me as someone who's often worked with freelancers in all my roles at the age, a lot of them are cracky and a lot now still in every day is we hear from freelancers that like defining what plagiarism is um, has come up for me a bit, which is um, oftentimes a freelancer will send in an idea but some because it's in something's in the news and simultaneously a staff member or another freelancer will have the same idea. 
the um, piece of work will go out and someone will feel really slighted as though their work's been stolen or their ideas been stolen. And I don't, I, th I just want to be really clear about what we're actually talking about here. I think people get confused. If plagiarism is, is, and I'm sure we'll hear from the experts about what it is and what it's not, but for me, it would be easy to steal those ideas, but because the code of ethics tells us not to, it's really important. And I've always resisted that temptation um, because at, at, at every step we need to be doing the right thing by the whole industry, not just what's in our in commercial interests or in our pride. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we definitely will flesh that out. Ginger, how do the code of ethics guide you? You're on mute. I remember first learning about the Code of Ethics when I was a baby journalist 100,000 years ago at RMIT. And I just love it because I think, you know, the job of a journalist is hold, to hold power to account and we need to do it in a way that's really fair and really honest and really respectful, which is not what the media is known for. Like, you know, when you see those surveys, I think we are more hated than any other profession, probably just um, above the clergy. <laughs> so it's really important that if we want to do our jobs properly, we do it in an ethical way. So I never don't think about the code of ethics. I especially think about it when I am trying to tell the stories of people who are not represented well or who've never spoken to the media before and people who've suffered trauma. And I try to think about how can I best represent them? How can I do it as fairly and kindly and humanely as possible? Um, and I probably take it to a great extreme. But I've got to say that that is not how the media has treated me, <laughs> um, even though I've been we'll, a journalist we'll pick up on that. for a long time. Yeah, we'll so pick. it's really interesting. I've, I've had a lot of crisis moments in the last few years, Karen, where I've wondered if I can stay in the industry because it's so unethical. So, you know, we need the code of ethics more than ever is what I would say in short. Brilliant. James, James, um, what, what, how do the code of ethics sort of shape the way you go about your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, I think um, the code of ethics is the it's at the core of news gathering. Um, we are uh, we um oh, I'm stalling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you when you find yourself with an ethical, ethically difficult situation, yeah, like what are you we thinking? we cover all sorts of different stories, and um, the code of ethics is there so that people know the public know that we're from a reputable news organization um anyone can um buy a tv you know camera or um start a youtube channel and i think it's really important that um there is this code of ethics in place to um professionalize us as well um especially in the age of social media um yeah it, like it's more like it's just integral to the news industry that we do have this code in place. So when you think about the ethicalness of the Australian media, one being low to 10 being high, where do you reckon the, the, the media industry is? Um, it's so diverse and there's so many different publications and news organisations, but I, yeah, I think to quickly summarise, maybe a six, yeah. Ginger, where do you think on that scale of why the media might be again mute? I don't think the media is one thing, as James said. So, but um, I have been in the media for more than 20 years now and I've done more than 100 interviews about my book. And I'm only saying that because I am shocked at the unethical behaviour of journalists. And I'm not just talking about from the Daily Mail. I'm talking about even journalists from the ABC. I just had some appalling experiences where my work wasn't attributed, journalists were unprepared. At one stage I gave audio that I had recorded to a very reputable outlet in their broadcast. They said it was their audio, despite me having put myself and my family at risk to get it. Chunks of my book appeared in articles as if the journalist had gathered that information. Um, so it was effectively plagiarized. It goes on and on and on. So 
Um, as a cohort, I'm very worried about our industry. Mm. So what where on that where on that scale? I mean, there's some very good journalists. I I would not say that But I need you the, to do the one to ten. Two, uh, three, probably four. about two. Yeah. Okay. After. Okay, back to you. We've got some work to do. Back to you, what are your thoughts? Um, as someone who takes a keen interest in the second uh, code, the second number in the code, which is not placing unnecessary emphasis on personal characteristics, including race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, age, sexual orientation, family relationships, religious belief, or physical or intellectual disability. Um, we look at the kinds of people that have had a really rough go of it when they've uh, breached COVID regulations that has not been reported fairly and the racism in our industry breaches the code. People don't think about it that way, but it does breach the code and it really disappoints me. And out of 10, I would, I'm probably a bit more optimistic than Ginger, but I'd probably put it out of five. All right. So we've got plenty to do within our sector. So now we're going to um, a little bit more, we've, we've set a really good tone here, I think a really good um, tone for the, the plagiarism side of things particularly. So we're going to hear from Kate Haddock. Um, Kate has a, she's a lawyer with Banky Haddock Biore in Sydney, and she's had 25 years experience uh, advising on copyright issues in the music and the book publishing industries. She's also got extensive experience in dispute resolution and copyright litigation in the Federal Court of Australia and the Copyright Tribunal of Australia. Kate and her firm have been great supporters of the Walkley's Foundation and I thank her for that. I'm going to give a five minute overview of copyright and how it might um, affect uh, those of you in the audience and certainly those of us who are, are right here tonight. So thank you so much, Kate, it's off to you. Um, that's a pleasure, thank you. And um, I just want to, use some of my five minutes by pointing out to Ginger that actually I think lawyers are hated uh, probably not as much as the clergy, but certainly more than journalists. Um, copyright in five minutes goes like this. Uh, copyright doesn't protect ideas, it protects the expression of ideas. Uh, so it doesn't protect the facts or information in, for example, a story that you have written, but it protects the way that you have said it to the extent that what you have done is original. The second point, is that copyright is an exclusive bundle of rights that belongs in the first instance to the creator of a work. And a work can be a literary work or an artistic work. Um, there's also subject matter um, such as films and sound recordings, uh, there's musical works. And so it's sort of the, the gamut of creative material and the products that embody creative material. Um, if you are employed to create that material, your employer will be the owner of the copyright in the material um, under the Copyright Act, unless your employment contract says otherwise. Uh, that means that the position, the copyright ownership position is different uh, as between employed journalists and freelance journalists, because at the, in the first instance, a freelance journalist will own the copyright in anything that he or she has created, whereas an employed journalist, the employer will own the copyright. That's very significant for enforcing um, your rights if, if your rights have been inf infringed. Uh, that is always subject to contract and certainly in my experience of looking at um, uh, employment and freelance contracts from certainly major media organisations, uh, the proprietor would take the copyright in work by freelancers uh, as well. The third point is that um, to infringe someone's copyright, uh, or what happens when, when copyright is infringed, is that a substantial part of the original work is reproduced. That's what copyright infringement is. It's, uh, there's probably a technical distinction between plagiarism, which I think more often refers to taking someone's ideas and not attributing them properly, and, and copyright infringement, which is actually reproducing something of someone's uh, creative work product that um, that you've taken. Um, the key test there is the question of what is a substantial part. The, the, the relevant test is, is it a substantial part of what of the original work, not is it a substantial part of what it's been put into. So uh, even if you take if you take a paragraph of a book, 
uh, which may or may not be a substantial part of that book, but it's a tiny little part of the thing that you put it into, that's not the relevant test. The relevant test is, is it a substantial part of the original? Substantiality isn't just a quantitative question. It also, it, it also involves uh, issues of quality. And so if you take um, a relatively small part of an original work, but it's the guts of the, of the work, that can be a substantial part, even if the work is huge and the part you've taken is quantitatively quite small. One common misconception is that there's some magic percentage. There is no percentage. The Act, that the people get confused because the Act in some place, the Copyright Act does talk about 10% or one chapter of a book. That's in relation to a different part of the Act and a different scheme. That's not in relation to normal infringement. Um, I get asked a lot, uh, you know, uh, by people who are accused of infringing copyright, um, how much do I have to change of the original work? And people ask me that a lot in relation to artistic works because, you know, graphic designers will sometimes say, oh, but, but I, I changed 20% of it. So that's not the test. The test is, did you take a substantial part of the original? My fourth point is that there are exceptions to infringement that in Australia we call fair dealing. Um, exceptions. We, do, we don't have fair use in Australia. Uh, what you do is you look to see whether the use falls within one of a number of specific purposes, and then you look to see if the use is fair. The purposes are reporting news, criticism or review, parody and satire, and research and study. Those aren't the only exceptions. There are separate exceptions for reporting court proceedings and so on, but that, those are the fair dealing exceptions. And finally, the fifth point is that the remedies for infringement include injunctions and damages or an account of profits, but usually damages. An injunction means you're entitled to go to the court and get an order that the person stops infringing your work, takes it down and so on. Um, and damages are usually based on a reasonable or industry standard license fee, but you can be entitled to additional damages for what we call flagrant infringement. That's my five minutes. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. That was well done. Um, Ginger Gorman, you've told us that, you know, you've had a lot of your material ripped off. Yes. What do you do about it? Well, uh, the most famous incident caused my name to trend on Twitter around Australia and um, it was in 2017. And essentially, I had done this horrendous investigation about men who were sexually abused by their mothers. And I'm telling you the background because it was really important to think about mental health of my case studies. Um, within about an hour of it being published, Mama Mia took about 80% of it and the Daily Mail also took about 80% of it. The It was horrendous because I was so, so scared about my case studies and the way that those ripped off articles were headlined. And I didn't know what to do. I cried and ate my daughter's entire birthday cake. And then I contacted a lawyer who sometimes does pro bono work for me because I'm a social justice um, journalist. And he said this would cost about $300,000 to take to court. So I decided that I was just going to use my media platform, actually. And I just chucked a giant tantrum. And I posted a letter that I wrote to Mamma Mia on my Facebook page. and. I think that has been seen by about 70,000 people. Basically the media pressure that bore down on Mamma Mia and the audience pressure forced them to take it down. They never apologised. Um, Mia Friedman told The Guardian she'd apologised, which was actually untrue. She'd refused to apologise. And what I did with the Daily Mail was I sent them an invoice, not because I thought they'd pay it, but it was just kind of a media stunt. And they sent me a very nasty legal letter to which I just laughed at. But they did also end up taking, they've plagiarised me a lot, the Daily Mail. They took one of the stories down because they're worried about the mental health implications, but not the other one. So I think the answer is it's really difficult, especially if you're a freelancer, Karen, because you don't have the powerful resources of an organisation behind you. You don't have in-house lawyers. James, um, you've done freelance photography as well. Um, what do you do if you see your image somewhere? What are the ways you go about trying to do something about it? Yeah, it's definitely hard just to keep up with the day-to-day -day usage, let alone the life of a, a wire photograph. Um, once 
the photos are filed to the wire. They um, like our partner agencies pick them up, and then they have their partner agencies and so on and so forth. So, yeah, they can end up pretty much anywhere around the world. Um, so yeah, it's definitely like a really tricky situation um, following uh, where they end up. Um, I guess yeah, we've got a commercial team that looks after the legal side of things um and yeah photographers have definitely um had to you know hit up them about issues um a pretty common one is actually journalists from um subscribers um who can download uh our photographs on their company's systems and then posting them to twitter like it's not a huge deal but it's an example of um you know how yeah it, things go unnoticed amongst us as journalists as well when really we should be doing the right thing um yeah it's um that's it back to you um where, where does a story you know i guess going back to some of your commissioning days um mm -hmm. in, in maybe crikey or the age but you know where does it become, where, where does that line of we're following somebody's story, which is what we all do all day, every day, without sort of the ecosystem of the age then doing something and then the ABC doing something and we all following it, you know, without that ecosystem, there is no news industry really. But where does that line go between you're following up a story and you've mm. actually just ripped it off whole of all and I think it comes down to good faith. So my, one example I actually have in my current role is um, we, this is probably not the hard hitting journalism that, that Ginger's doing um, all the time, but we have a guy um, who's really popular on our channels called Tom the Fruit Nerd. And he does, he gives tips about picking fruit and that's, we pay him. Um, it's exclusive content. We come up with the ideas ourselves. Like it, it follows all those kind of, basic tenants and the Daily Mail wrote it up um, as having, and they claimed that he posted on his social media first, which isn't true. And I emailed them and asked them to change that. And I didn't hear back. And it made, and they had just, they had, the whole article they had written was, this man has a social media video. This is what the video says. It's about four paragraphs. You know, that's, it's really not, um, going and doing your own work. And that's the business model, right? The business model is um, very much based on what, what are things that other people have invested in, come up with ideas for that we can, we can kind of scrape the cream off and, and pass off of it as our own. And I think it comes down to good faith. Like, are you making a good faith attempt to take that story further? Are you making it your own in some way? Are you putting the stamp that your particular organization would have because, you know, you have a history of covering this issue in a particular way or, you know, say um, there's a big story in the age in the morning, but Virginia Trioli picks it up. She's always going to bring new experts in. She's going to be asking those next step questions to politicians. That's what makes it um, compelling and unique and, and not just lazy <laughs> and, and also breaking the code. <laughs> But that's really important what you just said, Bhakti, about the business model because there's a lot of media organisations like the Daily Mail and that is their business model. Like they are lawyered up because they know the likes of me are going to write a letter because they steal every day. Ginger, I want to talk about, you picked up on, um, you know, the mental health. What kind of response have you had when you've got somebody that you've interviewed over something pretty sensitive and suddenly they're seeing their name and their story all over the place? What is it they're saying to you about how that feels and what it does. Well, it's horrendous. And I guess that's the thing, Karen, like we talk about this often like copyright and plagiarism as if it's a legal thing, but these are people's lives. And it, if you can't tell the stories of marginalized people because they get trodden on in this way, it damages the whole community. I mean, in the instance of the two men in that story, I was really scared about one of them because the, he had had a lifetime of child abuse. <laughs> you know, he they, these were very damaged people trying to get on with their lives and tell a story that no one wanted to tell. They were okay, those two men in the end, but I definitely have reported stories. One particular one was about a young man um, who essentially got a form of silicosis from man-made stone. 
and um, he was a Morris Blackburn client. He was dying essentially at the age of 27. And he was warning people about man-made stone and working with man-made stone. And that story got ripped off by a lot of outlets. And he also got a lot of predator trolling because of it. And he was devastated um, because he was on death's door anyway. <laughs> he was going to die anyway. And he was trying to protect other people. So, um, and he said to me, I would never speak to the media again, you know, and I think we've got to think about the damage that that does if you can't tell these stories and you're hurting people who are already traumatized like I want to think that I treat people with respect and care and I go to all these lengths to protect them from trauma in the processes of my work but I can't protect them from the daily mail and that's quite frightening to me like I've actually started to say to people you know this could get ripped off I'm just warning you because it's so prevalent and knowing yep, that that means yeah, they might not talk to me. Well, I was actually yeah, just thinking about another angle on this, which is um, the usage of stock images or other images from um, agencies, which is we think really hard about how we use those as well. Mm. Because we have access to them doesn't mean you can use them in any context you want. And that goes back to the mental health of the people in those images. So if they are... Um, if, for example, we're using an image of someone on a story where it could be implied that they have a mental health issue or they're um, involved in domestic violence or, you know, something else that could be seen as really negative. We're just really careful about that kind of, of usage. So to me, it's not like there's, there's got to be a higher bar to clear than like, we can just, we can do it. Yes. James, and have you ever found, sorry, I'll, James, have you ever found your photograph somewhere and gone, oh my Lord, why is it there? That's something that you've come across? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, they photos take on their lives of their own, so you know you can it, you sort of have to remain apolitical um, as a wire photographer, whether it's you know viewing your images or covering an, an event. Um, it's, yeah, it's just the way that it has to operate. Um, yeah, but I yeah, no, no, no huge surprises though. That's, that's good to hear. I think we'll take this, um, this is the opportunity where we're going to hear from our second expert presenter today. That's John Bergen. He's a project manager of, manager of the Google News Initiative um, who works as part of the Walkley Foundation work. So he's delivering digital training to journalists, photographers and the like across Australia. So um, John, take it away. You've got your five minutes. Hi everyone. Let me just um, share my screen quickly. Uh... There we go. Hopefully you can now see my slides. Uh, yell out if you can't. Um, great pleasure to be here. Fantastic, thought-provoking discussion. Um, absolutely riveting stuff. What I'm going to do today with the five minutes that I've got is to run through how you can, some really basic steps um, and frequent steps that you can take to ward off um, inadvertently sharing um, unattributed or misattributed um, content, be that video or images um, or false and misleading information. Um, first cab off the rank is any kind of search by image or reverse search by image um, functionality. Um, everyone knows that you can search Google for images, but you can also search by images. Now you can do this in Bing, you can do this in Yandex, you can do it in any search engine. You can also do it in Google. And of course, to do it on Google, you go to imagesgoogle.com and click on the camera icon. And if you haven't done it before, it's really simple. You can search by image URL we can upload images directly from your computer or drag them into your file browser. And so it allows you to show instances of where a image that is somewhere available on the web can be found elsewhere by the search engine. Or if you've got something sent directly to you via email or perhaps by WhatsApp, you can also upload the image and it can compare and contrast and see if that image has been used anywhere else. It's a fantastic resource that I encourage everybody to use as the first response when you get an image to verify its point of origin. Now, all search engines have their equivalent of reverse image search, as I mentioned, um, and there's lots of them out there. Go and find whatever one works for you. It also serves incredibly well to go to the search engine that tends to be predominant and popular in a geographic area that you're searching within. So if you're looking for information relevant to, say, Russia or Eastern European states, you're going to find the search engine Yandex will often have better search results than say Google. 
Google is a global search engine. It is the dominant search engine, that much is true. It doesn't have every single media market and every single consumer market tied up. Um, a great alternative is Tin. Can you still hear me? Thanks. Uh, you lost. dropped out for a little bit there, John. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry about that. Now, I was just saying there was a, a, a Revi Chrome extension that I encourage you to use, um, and you can use that. And the reason why this is really useful is there's this thing called false context. And you see an image and there's forensically nothing wrong with it. It hasn't been doctored in any way, shape or form. But when you go searching for it, it's just simply not when and where it claims to be. And so when we take this image that you see on your screen of an iced over four wheel drive and we specify the date range, we can see that it's not where it claims to be. And I've encountered this in the wild myself. I've seen it in 2011, 2013, as recently as last year, it's as early as 2005, and it is, of course, of Lake Geneva. Bookmark this website that you see on your screen, and it allows you to access a handy dashboard where you can go through um, advanced search operators and actually refine your search when you're looking for images out there. I want to use the time that I've got left, about a minute, two minutes left, to talk about uh, generative adversarial networks, or typically and commonly called deepfakes. All these people that you see on your screen here, uh, this is the big, bad, scary world that we live in. These are all synthetic humans or rendered images. These people don't exist. And if you want to really while away the hours, go to this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Basically, a GAN is dueling um, algorithms that learn out of a sample of information how to create a face. Um, it's a thing called a generator, and it's a thing called a discriminator. And the trick is it fools the program into creating a face that can slip under the radar and can't be detected. And when it is able to do so, a deep fake is produced. Now, these are becoming increasingly more prevalent. I'm just gonna race around the track and show you some dead giveaways when it comes to um, these GANs. First of all, the background will always be abstract. It really struggles with backgrounds. You'll also notice the strange clothing and accessories, mismatched fabric. So on this particular example that you see here, you can see that there's two different kinds of fabric. The teeth are always very strange. If you zoom in, they kind of bleed into the mouth uh, or they look rendered or flat. And the eyes will always be strangely sort of dead-eyed or asymmetric. Uh, and often they'll have a bad hair day. They'll have strange flyaway hair and they'll have strange sort of like luminescence or iridescence around that particular border. So these are just some basic giveaways that you can use to handle um, deep fakes. I'd also encourage you to search for a tool called Forensically on the web or go to that really long-winded website that you see up on the screen. And this will allow you to take, go through a whole bunch of tools that allow able to sort of analyze different layers and different variables of images and perhaps point to the fact that they might be fake. Last but not least, a really useful tool when you're dealing with deep fake videos is called Watch Frame by Frame. It does exactly what it says on the side of the tin. It goes forwards and backwards frame by frame. If you're accessing a video on YouTube, you can use the full stop and the comma keys on your keyboard to advance backwards and forwards. You can actually look at each particular frame. And often when you're looking at video and seeing it in the cold light of day, some of these tips and tricks that I just mentioned to you that are applied to images stand out in individual frames. So this is, of course, deep fake Tom Cruise. Um, I encourage you to go and have a look at how this is made on YouTube. The artist is called Chris Umi. And I also encourage you to go and check out a really excellent episode of Foreign Correspondent that went to air just last week, I believe, um, called America Deepfake that takes you through this process. So that's my five minutes, I believe. Uh, hopefully I managed to get in underneath um, the time limit. Um, here are all the URLs that I mentioned. A little over time, but I'll give you. <laughs> thank you. I did have a small technical A little over. So thank you so much. My pleasure. No worries. And we are going to put John and Kate's um, email addresses in the chat so that you can contact them specifically about some of the um, issues that you might have or if you didn't quite understand anything. Um, James, I'm going to go to you first because um, this must scare the bejesus out of you um, when you look at what can be done with the manipulation of images. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on how sophisticated some of this stuff is? Um, yeah, it's definitely worrying. Um, from a news photographer's perspective, the images we just saw though, they don't really have 
much news value or context in them. They're mostly just faces and, um, yeah, people. So I guess it comes more into the identity creation or, well, it's not really theft if it's a fake person to begin with. But, um, yeah, it's definitely not good as, like, yeah, all the wire photographs that um, we file, they're all shot in camera. Um, so there's limited... Um, manipulation we can pretty much just edit a photo um so that it's um just slightly enhanced um there's a bit more tonality um we can't add or subtract any content um that's a big no-no of course um and yeah that's sort of the crux of yeah how we go about taking uh photos in the field um we have to shoot everything in a jpeg file which is a specific file type um so it's, you've got less ability to pull back detail and add um detail um yeah back to you have you ever been sent dodgy photos and gone oh what can i do about that uh not specifically um photos that i was concerned are dodgy i mean for us it is more often um the question of um supplied photos from uh talent and just like the chain of custody around that is just I don't think I don't I've never had a suspicion that they're that they are um fake but more that it's something that I've just uh, in news stories in particular you want to be extra vigilant about does this reporter have the, the like ultimate faith that who's whoever's passed on these photos are, are what they say they are is there someone else is there another photo that verifies it from another angle or another device you know those are the kinds of questions that you'd be asking a reporter especially if they're talking if they've got an exclusive or you know they're talking to someone in a isolated situation in some way that those are the kinds of things that have come up for me especially um in immigration detention reporting and I guess one of the issues too these days is that once upon a time, and we talked about this in the previous um, Code of Ethics webinar about privacy, but it goes that once upon a time you had to um, get a photograph from a family or whatever. Now in the age of the internet and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, et cetera, there's photos of people all over the place. Ginger, I'm wondering your thoughts on that. It's a really common practice. I know I've done it myself, gone looking for somebody's photograph. Um, and, you know, it's a public domain unless you've got some kind of privacy, you know, big privacy, um, you know, settings on your social media. So what are your thoughts? Um, just quickly, I just wanted to talk about the deep fakes, which I've come across a lot in my cyber hate work. So people are, you know, essentially pornography is made about them and they are not actually that person. And I'm very worried about um, the way that is going to intersect with uh, cyber hate attacks against female journalists because the cyber hate attacks against female journalists are extreme and politicians. Um, I never, ever take photos without permission. I just never do it because you don't know where the photo was taken. You don't know if there's some special meaning attached to it. You know, I just think that's a really ethical concern. You have to, you have to get permission to use photos. Um, anyone can take a photo from Facebook, but do you know the context in which it was created? Do you know if that was, at, um, you know, someone's funeral who suicided? You don't know. And so I think it's terrifying to take images when you don't know the source of them or any of the ethical quandaries behind them. Like, just Chase, because... It doesn't have just, to be the actual... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say what Bhakti said before, which... Sorry, there's a bit of delay, I think, with my internet. I apologise. No, 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 totally fine. Go ahead. Uh, frozen? I'm not sure whether it's me or we can anyway, hear you. I've got to go to you, James. Um, it's not a, yeah, you can, but you can't see me. Okay. So um, James, just wondering, because it doesn't have to be just an actual manipulation of it. It's not just the, the Photoshop or, well, you know, there's, there were some real issues last year in COVID when photographs were taken of people on beaches, et cetera, sort of saying, oh, they're not COVID compliant. Walk us through what would have happened there. <laughs> well, I guess to set the picture, like we can choose, you know, what cameras we take out with this, what lenses, um, and then what the settings we use to capture those images. Um, 
with the COVID beach photos, um, the photographic community come under a bit of spotlight when uh, <laughs> uh, photos were circulating of you know crowded beaches and people weren't doing the right thing and social distancing. But um, actually, in some instances, not all, um, the individual photographer was caught out um, taking a long tally photo lens onto the beach and um, long focal lengths um, compress the background of images so it can make it um, objects appear a lot um, closer and condense. Um, it can also isolate them depending on uh, what settings you choose. But um, yeah, there was particular photographs um, that shut, ended up shutting beaches down during COVID, which isn't good because, you know, some people only had an hour window to, you know, pop down to the beach. And I think the one in Victoria that got shut down or if it didn't get shut down, the photographer was criticised anyway for trying to make this photo of a beach that was, for the most part, I think everyone was doing the right thing. Um, so, yeah, that's like a pretty unethical example of how an unmanipulated photo can be, you know, circulated um, around. Um, but I guess it just comes down to whether the beaches were full or empty. So our job's to go out and observe and then report back with pictures, not go out and create something with a specific direction to push an agenda. Um, yeah. And that seems to pick up on what Ginger was saying earlier about the pressure of the industry itself or media pressure actually kind of exposing some of that stuff. Um, Ginger, I'm just wondering more generally about when, when you're looking at kind of freelancing and, you know, as a freelancer, you need to sell a story a number of times and it would be the same with a photo as a freelancer. You need to, you know, the, the one gig isn't going to pay the bills necessarily. How can you do that in the digital age where, you know, now I can access any website, any news website anywhere, and if I read the same story, it may not necessarily be plagiarism, but once upon a time, I know when I was a freelance reporter in Russia, I could sell the same story to a number of different um, organisations online and because there was less connectedness. It was always a, a very different version of the story. I would have different talents sometimes, but can you do something like that these days? How um, sensitive are news organisations to how different a story has to be? Mostly you can't resell them. I think those days are long gone. Uh, I say I've only ever done it between like, say I used to publish a huge investigation on news.com.au and I may be able to publish a version on it on Radio National but an audio version but mainly you can't sell the same things twice. I think freelancers are having to come up with really sophisticated business models where basically they are doing all kinds of different work not just one kind of work so usually you get freelancers who are also copywriting as well as doing news reporting as well as media training as well as we call them slashes they they're often doing photography as well so they're not one thing otherwise they just can't pay their mortgage <laughs> you know they can't pay the rent and it's getting harder and harder I think You've got to have a really strong personal brand, use a lot of social media, all that stuff. Yeah, you can't really be repackaged these days, sadly. Bakhti, would that, Bakhti, is that your experience? Or you would not, it has to be absolutely original. You can't have somebody selling a, a different version to you and, and maybe a local paper or a different kind of publication? Yeah, I would, I would probably agree with that. Although you look at the example of... Um, now it's her, her Brittany, the Brittany Higgins story that was obviously split between two networks or two two outlets, um, one print, one broadcast, and that was the biggest story in the country for for you know months really. So um, it's obviously doable uh, for for the on the rare occasion, but I would say for the most part, if it's not a scoop that big, probably not. I'm going to um, go to questions. We've got one in the chat from Dale Webster, which I'm going to put to James, even though you were talking, James, about how, you know, there's a little opportunity for you to manipulate given the circumstances that you're in. Dale's question is sort of talking about the fact that, um, and he admits to showing his age, it's about the other end of the scale of picture manipulation. Back in the uh, old days, any photo that was altered had to be flagged. With the advent of digital photoshopping thing, photo with the edge, 
with the advent of digital, photoshopping things out of the background, etc. And while you not might might not be doing this, James, it does happen. We know it happens. Mm. Um, right? Is it right or wrong these days in a news shot to manipulate something, even if it doesn't actually change? The, the sense of the, it's not editorial different, but it has been a, a manipulation of the photo. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess there's sort of two ways to look at it, whether it's manipulation through Photoshop or manipulation through your own direction. Um, we are, I guess just, yeah, you want to be able to just edit a photo to like really just enhance it so it's viewable. Um, like for my workflow personally, it's basically just crop a little bit of like contrast or um, you can dodge and burn, which is sort of isolating a specific section of the photograph and making it darker or lighter um, and then sharpening just to make it pop a little bit. And then, yeah, off it goes. Um, and then also, um, yeah, like we can have to declare any... Um, posing so if we take a portrait we have to disclose that um you know it's been a, po a posed situation but ultimately you don't want to be um giving too much direction or um sensationalizing the content um especially on the wire we keep it pretty pretty limited um but yeah we can't be you know changing the color of the sky or you know blurring out you know a truck or something like just to make it a little bit cleaner it's just yeah that's just not the done thing with wire photography or news photography in general um i think does that answer the, your question Dale? can i just yeah that's in, good karen you. karen can i just jump in and say though with airbrushing tools on your phone like i wrote a story bhakti i'm confessing here to you now um i wrote a story for abc every day and it was about my kids because and um, dealing with bringing them up as mixed race kids when I'm not. But the photo I had took, I had a really wrinkly neck and I smoothed it out a bit, you know. So it's like this question about, um, I didn't want to look like I was 105, but actually, I guess in answer to Dale's question, I was manipulating the image and I didn't think about it really as being dishonest. I was just being vain. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, but there's actually a question here for Kate Haddock. I hope um, Kate's still on the line and I'll, um, this is from um, Saffron, I think Saffron Howden. Could you please touch on the copyright, copyright around supplied Im images? Reporters are increasingly using images supplied from the public. Then these goes into photo libraries. So um, this is not touching on the ethics of the photo, but like what's the copyright, which is a great question. Yeah, so um, I'd, I'd start this answer by saying that uh, one thing that I didn't mention before is that journalists who are employed by newspapers or magazines um, do own part of their copyright subject to their employment contract, and that is that they can use their works in books that they have that they get published, um, and they are entitled to uh, photocopying royalties. Um, so those are two potential other income streams for journalists that the Copyright Act has sort of carved out. Um, and that leads into the answer to this question, which is that copyright is an incredibly flexible thing. And although assignments and exclusive licenses have to be in writing, um, non-exclusive licenses don't have to be in writing and they can even be implied. And I think that where members of the public send in photographs to media organisations, um, you need to be really aware of the fact that they are effectively granting a licence, um, not an assignment, uh, and the terms of that licence are sort of curtailed by the circumstances of, of the supply. And so if I send in a photograph of the sunrise to ABC Breakfast um, and, so, you know, for Nate to put on his great photos, um, the question of what, what is my intention and what does the ABC understand is my intention of me supplying that photo is probably it's understood that it's for that segment. It's not for the ABC to put in a photo library, um, which I don't think they would do, or to publish a calendar or to um, publish a book. Uh, you know, the copyright still belongs to me. Um, and so I think that the the circumstances of people supplying photographs need to be scrutinised in order to work out what the terms of the licence actually are. There's definitely a licence. 
There's heaps of people who give away their copyright material for absolutely nothing, which I never understand. But, um, you know, it's a really valuable <laughs> right, but people do just give it away. Um, but uh, increasingly I see on Twitter, you know, so an individual will post a photograph and news organisations will all say, can I contact you for a licence? So there is that practice that goes on. The other thing that you need to be really careful about is taking photographs from Facebook because just because something's on Facebook doesn't mean that um, the photographer doesn't own the copyright in it. And so, uh, and and the photograph of, a, you know, often the photograph will be of a person, um, but someone else has taken that photograph and it will be the person who took the photograph who owns the copyright, not the person uh, who it's a photo of. And um, to a large extent, that type of use of Facebook photographs is probably dealt with under the fair dealing exception for reporting news because probably you get photos from Facebook when someone when, when something has happened and a person is in the news for some reason. Um, but then I think you would also have to take account of the fact that a fair dealing has to be fair. Uh, and so query whether in some circumstances for some news stories, um, going back to the type of things that Ginger was talking about before, is it fair to take a photograph of a person who might have had some completely terrible thing happen to them and, uh, you know, post on Facebook a photograph of them at a party. Yeah, I think that's um, a really, really great advice. I know that I had, uh, I took a photograph of, a, of one of the fuzzy wuzzies when he was in Melbourne. It was a fabulous photograph. It was by the water and, and a certain national broadsheet newspaper pinched it without um, accreditation. And I did the ginger kind of just trolled them online and said, hey, it's really great that you've used my photograph, but it might be time to, you know, give me some credit for it. So I think they put my name, but they wouldn't put ABC because they have a certain aversion to ABC. But um, there's a great question from Venus Valesi. What are some of the values and principles which can help overcome some of the challenges spoken about this evening. I'm going to post Venus the, the code of ethics, which is what we're talking about here. These are the guiding principles. For me, it's about what would I like done to me? What, what you know, it's that whole do unto others. So if, 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 if something were to happen to me, how would I feel about it? So that's kind of one of my guiding principles. But I reckon you would all have um, something similar. So I'm going to put the code of ethics um, in the chat there. But back to you, firstly, what, what sort of guides you? What's the moral compass you use when you're addressing some of these things? Uh, it's a similar one, but I think about how I would explain it to someone who has faith in me or thinks highly of me and would they would they respect me if I said, oh, yeah, I just, what I do for a living is I take other people's ideas and um, kind of do what I can to pass them off. You know, I think it's it's what you do. If you're talking about it to people and you feel happy to talk about it to people, that's a good sign that it's within your current set of values and ethics. And if you're doing it kind of on the quiet, um, maybe not. But at the same time, I don't know if that test applies to some people. Some people are just shameless, but that's 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 what works for me. And I think calling out, being really um, clear about what um, it is your expectations are, whether it's being an editor or, you know, Ginger, when you're submitting something, I think being very clear and being very clear to the people that you're interviewing. Um, Ginger, I guess I want to pick up on um, some of the consequences of plagiarism. Obviously, you would lose money. There are the issues with some of the people that you're interviewing and, and you know, potential moral or hurt for them. What else do you, do you think people need to keep in mind when it comes to, to you know, killing others' work? Well, I'm scared that if plagiarism continues in the way that it is, then public faith in the media decreases to the point where no one will engage with the media and it means we can't tell stories like we have an enormous position of privilege being in the media and that privilege may be just that you're in the media and you have a powerful storytelling platform but it's also um, things like the color of your skin whether you're a man or a woman you know and Oftentimes there's a massive power imbalance and if we abuse that, we're effectively damaging democracy and the entire society. So it's not to me just about individual hurts or whether we've broken the law. There's much bigger questions here. Look, I take, I really seriously take my position as a journalist. Like I'm trying to make society fairer 
and I'm trying to think about how we treat each other and I can't do it if my work is continually stolen because people won't trust me. You know, I find it terrifying actually. And in answer to Venus Khaleesi's question, like, you know, it's not just trying to think about honesty, fairness and, you know, the rights of others. It really is seeing your privilege and kind of using your power for good, for want of a better word, you know. Yep. James, um, what are your thoughts on how um, you could, you know, to Venus's question, what guides you? What makes you um, every day kind of ensure that you are, um, you know, what, what are the things that you think about? Um, yeah, it's definitely, I definitely think about how I want to be treated or how, I'd, you know, how my fa- I'd like my family to be treated if they were in a von- vulnerable situation. Um, each day is different for me on the road. We, you can end up at you know, some terrible scenes and um, see some confronting, uh, yeah, visuals. um, And then stories can go on for, like, months as well. Like, I'll shoot a crime scene and then you'll end up doing a vigil and then you've got the court case and then, you know, there could be, like, the length of coverage is, yeah, it can be quite long. Um, So there's different sort of stages of... um, I guess, ethical dilemmas along the way. Um, But I guess what drives me is knowing that, like, um, our news coverage is a really valued piece of information in Australia. Um, If Yeah, like, if if I didn't think um, there was going to be sufficient news coverage of a topic, then you'd step back a little bit and slow down. yeah. We have um, pretty much come back to almost the end of our time. I'm going to ask a very quick question and I need very quick answers. Um, what do you think is the one thing we would need to do, each of you, to boost that number? You know, that, co- that, that where do you think the ethicalness of, tonight, of um, the media is? What's the one thing you, if we could do it, that would boost? Um, first, I'll hear from you, James. Like, what, what's the one thing that we need to do to push up your six score? Yeah, look, um, I think more training for journalists, to be honest. Like, I've, I think it's been like four or five years now I've worked full time and I've learned every, everything on the road and through mentors and, you know, that's, you know, got me pretty far. But, yeah, there isn't really much opportunity for traditional training anymore um so i think yeah if we can improve one thing it would be that um you know these webinars are great that's a good one yeah i think there's yeah no no that's a good one yeah fantastic back to you uh have everyone had the experience of having an unfair story written about them because it feels like yeah, that would, that would straighten us out, wouldn't it? shit. <laughs> yeah. um, it's really, it's really upsetting and it makes you realise how much power you do have. Um, uh, you know, um, my husband's a journalist as well and we talk a lot about how we would never talk to a journalist ever about anything if we got asked and that says a lot. <laughs> um, so I think, and that. Yeah, I think that's probably true. <laughs> Um, so All right, Ginger, how do we get from your two to three? Sorry. Well, I'm just going to preface this by saying I'm going to be quick, but there's a huge resourcing issue in the media due to the rivers of gold drying up. It's worse in COVID, all of that. So resources are a massive thing. But I think mentoring is probably the key to a lot of this. Like the senior levels of the media have disappeared since 2010. There's the, you know, the MEAA starts to like, there's 5,000 people gone from the industry at least over the last decade. So that shows when you've got 20 year olds covering stories and they've had no mentoring and no guidance, they don't have the crusty old senior journo going, that's not honest, that's not fair and drumming it into them. And we need that. We need um, mentoring and we need our elders to support us to be good journos and stick to the code of ethics and understand what they mean. Brilliant. That's a great way to, uh, to wrap things up. And I apologise if there's been some um, technical and, and hiccuping and, and me jumping in at times that Erin 
appropriate. So I apologise. So thank you all for putting up for the panels and all of those uh, who've been watching as well. Um, I want a, a huge thanks to uh, Ginger Gorman, Bhakti Puvanantharam, James Ross, Kate Haddock and uh, John Bergen. Also Marcus Rowie is in the background. You haven't seen or heard of him today, but he's the one who's been um, driving things from the Walkley's point of view as well. So um, the admission fee that you will pay today as um, uh, the audience, uh, that $10 goes to the Media Safety and Solidarity Fund, which is assisting South, uh, sorry, Asia Pacific journalists in need in emergency times. And we know there's quite a lot going on in that region at the moment. So thank you. Um, it's uh, really worthwhile that we can be good citizens as, as um, journalists in the region. Our next event is on Thursday, July the 29th. That's when we'll be looking at section two of the code. And that's one that uh, Bhakti made reference to earlier about not placing unnecessary emphasis on personal characteristics, including race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, age, sexual orientation, family relationships, religious belief, or physical or intellectual disability. It's a, going to be a, a cracker of a conversation. So check out your favorite platform where you get your meal or walk please updates um, for the marketing on that. That will go out in the next couple of days. So once again, thank you all for a really terrific discussion. Um, and look, Kate and John, happy to answer any questions at any time, but it's been a real pleasure for me tonight to, to be alongside you all. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Karen. You're amazing. Thanks, James. Thank Thanks, Bhakti. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Thanks.